So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to everybody here in this uh, nice uh, uh, book of ro uh, room of books. And I hope no nobody tries to work and read uh, on the second floor because we will be debating something. So, concentration for other things might be low. And I hope this, there will be much reason for uh, this to be like I just described it. I have two great guests today I would like to introduce uh, to you. The first one next to me is Professor Michael Kuczynski. He is Assistant Professor of Organizational Behavior at Stanford University. And the other one is Professor Deb Roy. He's the director of the Laboratory for Social Machines at MIT Media Lab and Twitter's chief media scientist. Two people, um, two persons with lots of experience from an academic but also from a practical background. And we would like to discuss predicting psychological traits from digital footprints. So um, just jumping quickly into um, the realm of this overall topic, I can tell you, dear audience, if anybody of you thinks those things you do, you need, you like, the features of your personalities will stay a secret any longer, you are wrong, let me tell you. And you will know why you are wrong um, while following this uh, discussion. Um, I think we have entered a new area of psychological prediction based on big data. That is something we are discussing, we have been discussing for quite a while, but it, it, it's taking a new step. And um, if you dream of going back to the age of privacy, dream on, everybody. Google's DeepMind algorithm will turn the dream into a nice little movie with, uh, with a lot of uh, interesting things to learn what algorithms can do today. So let's jump into um, the, the details of this topic. And um, Michael, I'd like to start with you. Um, there was something like a turning point for your work, and that was the day um, the uh, US election took place and the morning after when you realized that Donald Trump um, had been elected uh, the next US president. You woke up in Zurich, interesting, that morning, watched TV and something happened to you. At least I read it from an article in Das Magazin from uh, Tagesanzeiger. So what happened to you that morning? Well, it was certainly a turning point for uh, each one of us in this room. And if you guys don't know it yet, you will probably uh, learn it soon or hopefully uh, uh, learn it as uh, late as possible. But it's definitely a turning moment. And this has been happening, use of algorithms in marketing and specifically in political marketing has been happening for some time. In fact, Barack Obama was one of the first uh, major mainstream politicians who used personalized marketing at a larger scale, at the large scale, and uh, specifically focused on uh, social media. Uh, back in 2013, I uh, published this paper where, in which I've shown that you can um, use digital footprints of behavior, pervasive ones, something that we all leave behind, like Facebook likes, to predict uh, intimate traits, such as political views, religiosity, personality, intelligence, whether your parents are divorced or not, your sexual orientation, and so on. And now, obviously, it's not only Facebook likes. Uh, I would say that, in fact, Facebook likes are probably not, uh, by far, not the most revealing type of digital footprint. Think about your, digi uh, your uh, browsing records, your search records, your credit card uh, data your uh, geographical location that is being constantly recorded by your phone. And uh, now all of those footprints are even more revealing. Why? Because you have less control over it. Uh, you know, you sit in your pajamas, you browse the internet, and you think like no one is watching. Well, guess what? This data is being recorded, and it is being used both to improve your lives in great ways. So we shouldn't forget that the great majority of the applications of the data analytic, uh, analytical models of algorithms are basically to improve your lives, to treat the disease, to save the environment, to improve the social systems. But obviously, as any other technology, they also expose us to new risks, like uh, uh, being... Um, like being a subject to, um, uh, to well, I wouldn't like to call it invigilation, but basically uh, it allows algorithms to reveal your private and intimate traits, perhaps without your knowledge and uh, behind your back and on a large scale. Uh, and then such knowledge can be used also to um, 
um, to, for instance, try to manipulate you to do uh, uh, things like uh, stop smoking, which might be great, and we talk about nudging here, or uh, stop voting, uh, which is not so great. Uh, but then and there's also a whole range of different other things that uh, an institution or another individual may try to uh, convince you or try to manipulate you to do. Coming back to the to the morning after the U.S. election, um, I understand you right that that this this moment was uh, uh, like a moment of insight, something like an epiphany, where you, where you uh, thought, well, we're we really entering a new state now, or is that exaggerated? Well, I. I think obviously it was an emotional moment for everyone. Like I came to Stanford the, the same day, actually later in the evening, and next day I was walking to work in the morning, and you had people crying, sitting on the benches there and crying, students. You don't really see students crying too much. But uh, it's, it's enough to see Donald, Donald Trump to be crying. You don't need data uh, analytics. So <laughs> maybe uh, you explain a bit more why you thought uh, this is a very special moment or a turning point. I think this was because it became apparent to me mm -hmm. that uh, we are actually sp uh, seeing uh, the moment where digital media and algorithms have changed the political system. Uh, uh, in, a very, um, in a very visible way. And I don't actually think that it changed the political system in a bad way, necessarily. So think about it for a second, guys. If you can target the message at people individually and adjust it to the taste, personality, dreams, fears of an individual, what suddenly happens is that the message becomes more important. If I just use TV, a large tube, to just send, yes, we can, one slogan, I basically have to choose an average message and send it to everyone, the same one single message. If I can talk with you guys individually, suddenly I get a tool to actually talk with you about issues. Also, being able to talk with you guys individually and use digital media like Twitter and Facebook to amplify my message, where people will repost my messages and share it with their friends, also decreases the cost of entry into the political race. Now, a lower cost of entry means lower role of industry, money, and lobbying in politics, which I personally think is great, but it also means that you have people like Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders, who did not have backing of establishment, who did not have much uh, money in their war chests, and yet managed, on one side, seriously uh, uh, threaten the establishment candidate, and on the other side, actually take over and win, in the end, the US election. So I think it was a big turning point. We kind of seen it happening before in terms of Brexit, where, again, a, a party uh, that was not, well, some people say it's a ragtag political militia, really, it's just, it was this kind of political insurgency without much backing in terms of money and organization, and yet they managed to spread their message. Uh, we've seen it in some Eastern European countries where, uh, where the same was happening. And... Now we've seen it in the large and a lot on the large scales scales in the United States. Mm -hmm. Rob, um, Deb, um, we. I think we're being recorded. Um, yeah, <laughs> probably, but I just hope nothing is going to be falling down on us. Let's see. Um, let us let us try to to stick a moment uh, with the the idea of this tipping point Michael was talking about. Can you relate to that um, regarding to the U.S. elections, maybe also the Brexit campaign, mm -hmm. and um, how do you think of the trade-off between uh, the the benefits on the one hand side, they are pretty clear, and the disadvantages or, uh, or even the dangers on the other hand side? How do you see that? Sure. So I think. Um Tipping point is a good way to think about what we also experience. We have, uh, sitting in our lab at MIT, we were studying the intersection of um, news coverage of the elections. We were tracking roughly 30 news outlets from left to right, uh, and also looking at uh, systematically what people on Twitter were saying about the elections and looking at the, the pattern. So this was kind of a, a grounding for some of my observations. Um, but maybe I can just add one comment about the, um, uh, the micro-targeting uh, factor, which absolutely we've seen a um, uh, completely new way to individualize and reach people that um, you know, has been, depending on how you count, a couple of decades at most in the making. So blink of an eye in, in terms of 
um, sort of our uh, sort of human history. Um, if you look in the if you look in the 2016 election cycle, um, there were a couple of other factors just to put this kind of micro-targeting into context. Um, one was, and uh, Mikhail already mentioned, uh, the, the broadcast um, you, you know, uh, slogan across television. Um, surely Donald Trump was the most televised candidate in the history of candidates. Um, and it was the same message and the same words that were being heard by men and women, young and old, uh, across uh, uh, race and religion and so forth. So uh, if you just look in terms of media impressions, <clears throat> the broadcast message um, uh, surely dominated if you just look at time watching TV and et cetera. So just as a, uh, it's an interesting factor because it was a absolutely shocking event, the outcome. Um, but there was a very strong broadcast component. Third is, um, and also Mikhail mentioned it, but let me just uh, amplify the implication of this. Um, it's one thing if you are receiving a message privately and it's individually tuned to you and only you hear it. It's a kind of private message delivery. The moment, um, as uh, Professor Ash called it yesterday, uh, the cats and dogs and mice, uh, the cats being large companies, the dogs being governments and the mice being us little people, um, the mice are networked and that creates a very different dynamic. So when I do get a message but I can talk about, hey, here's what I'm hearing, here's what I'm being told, um, the question is what, is, what is the effect of these three factors? Uh, a more broadcast uh, campaign than ever, people who are able to talk to each other uh, and the micro-targeting. So I think it's important to uh, as we think about the implications of micro-targeting, also think about the larger context, because that ability for people uh, who are previously relatively siloed to create incredibly large-scale and dynamic networks is equally new and is a kind of, uh, if not counterbalance, it's certainly a very different uh, force factor. And they were all at play in this election. So to your question, sorry, as a bit of a, an aside, um, or framing, is when I think about tipping points in 2016, um, our team, as we were sifting through um, very large data sets, looking at patterns of, <clears throat> of how uh, journalists were covering the elections, some of the divergences or systematic differences, uh, for example, uh, in America, if you look at millions of tweets, you will see over 18 months in the context of the U.S. election, race was uh, almost without fail one of the top three issues. If you looked at coverage in the uh, news, and I mean across the spectrum from MSNBC, which is a very left-leaning publication, to Breitbart, which I'm sure everyone here is now very familiar with, uh, is uh, uh, on the other side and everything in between. Race in the context of the elections uh, was not a big topic. Uh, usually when there was some kind of uh, an event, a shooting, there would be a spike in coverage and then it would come back down. So there was um, uh, these kind of systematic differences we were tracking. The tipping point, sometime in early summer, our team had a huddle and we were, sort, we were rooting, kind of looking for the right way to describe what we were starting to see and feel, actually, because we're, we're there, we're in the U.S., we're also uh, you know, part of the country and watching what's happening. And we call it a kind of awakening, uh, so a, a form of tipping point. And what we thought the awakening looked like was a very large group of people who realized there was the possibility to take a pretty radical kind of action. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a a candidate that represented, that was not about one party or the other, was, but was actually a kind of anti-system uh, vote, um, which is not a new concept, but the idea that it's worth even placing such a vote, that there's such a viable option, I think emerged in a few months. It was a very sudden uh, emergence of a concept in the public sphere. It has deep roots in terms of why people would want to take such an option, um, but the way something can suddenly surface is the internet and the ability for people to see each other, hear each other, and realize, oh, actually a lot of us are processing that broadcast message in a certain way. Um, so I, I think that was a, a kind of tipping point, a sort of early June. Um, and interestingly, more important than the data were some of the narratives. Uh, Scott Adams, 
the uh, um, uh, creator of Dilbert, uh, g gave an interview in the spring, essentially saying, look, Donald Trump's narrative somehow just rings true to me. This is someone who really knows the cultural vibes of the country. Mm -hmm. and, and so in spite of all the data and all of the very sophisticated kinds of, of tactics, it's interesting, at least for our team, of data scientists, machine learning people, et cetera, uh, certain narratives started to emerge that made sense, uh, more important than just the raw data. Um, so. so do I get you right in interpreting your words um, the way that, first of all, it's not all new, but <coughs> we, we experience a basic acceleration of uh, the use of data and the technology-driven um, uh, opportunities to, to, to give oneself a voice and to, to network th those voices in the first hand? I, I think I would not say there's nothing new here. This is all like before. I think. Uh, Essentially, the internet, with its ability to connect and create dynamic networks at scale, is new. We've never had this in human history. We've had human networks, we've learned how to scale human networks, but not with the, the speed, the scale, and the precision of selectivity. Um, and so one, one aspect of that is absolutely what Mikhail has, has studied and what uh, uh, companies have learned how to harness, which is this kind of micro-targeting. That's a kind of selectivity uh, which goes beyond direct mail. It goes beyond um, uh, sort of tuning your message in a, a kind of in-person sales pitch. It's something much more powerful. But the idea that um, in a few months, millions of people may realize that they actually have a shared set of interests that are represented by one candidate, uh, where that was not even a, a real possibility and so not covered by the media, uh, there is this alternative um, uh, network, the internet, which allows that kind of um, uh, concept to, to become part of the public, mm -hmm. public understanding. So I think um, to look for just the new and say that's what's going on, no, talk radio is not new, precedes television by a couple of decades, was a huge factor in this election. Um, the biggest single predictor of the outcome of the election was level of education at a county level, the single biggest predictor. Um, and if you have low level of education, you may have a preference for the spoken word over the written word. And talk radio selects for a certain... So there's a, a set of, um, I think, factors that go all the way down to kind of deepest levels of media that um, we can't ignore and were factors. So it's just saying we now stir the pot with um, this kind of, uh, not, again, the selectivity of micro-targeting. Why would it work when people can share? So Mikhail gets a totally message than I get, and we're friends on Facebook. So I say, hey, I heard this. And he says, well, I heard something completely different. We very quickly should be able to correct for any kind of uh, individualized messaging, unless we both are similar enough that we get the same message. Mm -hmm. So there is this uh, necessary context for these kind of methods to work, which is if we are sufficiently fragmented um, so that even when we compare notes with one another, we're comparing similar notes. Then this method, but also even the broadcast method from one candidate versus another, can take hold because it, there's a possibility for alternative narratives mm -hmm. to be held by the same country. So I think that's uh, uh, maybe too many words I've said, but I think those are some of the factors that were at play. And the tipping point was realizing we were so fragmented that an alternative reality or alternative uh, narrative with very divergent sets of facts that were grounding them could take hold. And we're continuing to see that play out uh, uh, under the, the current administration where um, there are groups who are able to hold very different stories of what's happening um, not just because there's alternate facts, but often alternate choice of facts of mm -hmm. which things to attend to. Um, Michael, can you, can you um, elaborate a bit on, on what's the difference between a data-driven campaign of Barack Obama and um, what Donald Trump has made use of for, for his campaign? Where's the, the mm. advancement? I think that the major difference is that, first of all, we... Uh, greatly increase, basically the populations of Facebook, Twitter, and other social media has uh, <coughs> increased by uh, large uh, numbers. So now uh, in most, uh, 
in most places you would have over 90% penetration of social media. So basically every single person out there is uh, connected and people spend increasing amount of time on Facebook. So last time I checked, it was over 40 minutes on average per user, <coughs> sorry, every day. So basically people migrated to this new environment, so obviously whatever messages you're sending there have a much larger influence. But also what happened is that the algorithms got much better uh, in the meantime. So obviously this is the space. Uh, digital marketing in general is pretty new, right? It started, whatever, 20 years ago maybe, maybe a bit more, but it really took off uh, even more recently. Uh, so people who are working in this market, who are showing you adverts, they're also learning. Uh, companies are learning how to uh, best target uh, their products and messages at you. So uh, we're basically just seeing more of it. Now, mm -hmm. one thing that people uh, keep overlooking is that, again, both sides of the uh, race were using it. And in fact, Hillary Clinton spent two and a half times more money doing the same thing. So basically micro-targeting people on uh, Facebook and other uh, digital environments like this. She hired also way better people that uh, Donald Trump uh, could uh, hire himself. Now the question obviously is, did she use some unethical, some of the unethical ways that uh, Donald Trump's uh, companies were boasting they were, they were using? We don't uh, really know. It might be just that the companies working on Donald Trump's side were more arrogant or more stupid uh, to basically admit to doing uh, certain, uh, certain things. We, now, we, need to, we need to stay there for a second or to make that clear because there is this one company, Cambridge Analytica, and, and the CEO, Alexander Nix, um, who publicly proposed that they, uh, in a way, decided uh, the, the Brexit decision and they decided the US election. Oh yeah, he's also, he also publicly announced that he adores Adolf Hitler's propaganda. Yeah, uh, I, I method, wanted to skip so. that, but thank you for, <laughs> for adding, adding upon that. So we, I think we need to put that in, into context, um, that uh, it's not about deciding in a way by using uh, a company, um, applying those uh, analytical methods, um, uh, deciding an elect, uh, election, or how do you relate to that? Well, obviously, if you're a company selling services of this kind, you would want to tell your future customers, yes, this is us who elected Donald Trump. Uh, well, they wouldn't mention that they worked previously for other politicians that were not uh, as successful. So this is not part of your uh, sales speech, obviously. <laughs> uh, also, there's an interesting aspect there, actually, because they used to say, oh, it's like all us, and we did this amazing personality micro-targeting. But then what happened is that they got under a lot of legal heat in, in, the, in the European Union because it seems that they didn't really collect their data in uh, all legal ways. And also maybe they have received like a, a cease and desist letter or whatever it's called from Facebook that asked them to stop doing whatever they were doing. And suddenly they realized that by telling everyone, oh yeah, we did that, they kind of just really admit to having committed something that we probably shouldn't have done. So now actually when you listen to Cambridge Analytica representatives, they would go out and tell everyone, oh no, we, just, we never actually did any micro-targeting, it was just all traditional. Uh, traditional things that other people are doing. So you can actually see that whether com that companies that would that the companies talking about it or not talking about it does not mean is not indicative of whether they are doing it or not. Because you may have other companies doing it as well, just not uh, talking about it. And most likely you have other companies mm -hmm. going and doing it. Maybe they're not using ocean model as Cambridge Analytica try to um, kind of build their brand on, on this particular personality model. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, the game is about trying to predict your future behavior. Whether you use it, whether you use uh, ocean model or MBTI model or any other psychological model, or maybe you even entirely skip the psychological modeling stage and you just ask the computer to, hey, our computer algorithm, to directly predict for you, okay, which of those people are uh, be uh, willing to change their minds and then try to focus on messaging those people, or which of those people uh, don't uh, sound uh, too educated and you can try to manipulate them with some messages. So, again, you can skip completely predicting personality and just go directly to predicting uh, 
behavior, mm -hmm. as a future mm -hmm. behavior, potential for a future behavior. But that's a basic uh, difference then. Um, if this happens, we have a basic difference in, uh, in how we, we look at a human being. Um, Deb, I would like to, to embellish on that a bit. So if this predictive model uh, works well, then what about the human being as autonomous, free, uh, an individual personality uh, who takes decisions like he or she wants to, sure. we can get rid of that, right? <laughs> so, I mean, there is a basic question of <clears throat> agency, and if you look at a underlying driver, a lot of the evolution of in, uh, communication technologies, it's optimizing for a, a basic function, which is uh, give us people what we want. Mm -hmm. And the more you optimize for that, you have all sorts of unintended consequences. And the question is, when we as individuals act, like staying on a, a, a web page, staying, clicking on an ad and so forth, we are taking actions driven by what we want in the moment. But we may have very different wants when we take a step back. And as behavioral economists have taught us uh, how we decide what we, which food for, we reach for today may be at odds with the goals we've set for our health in the future. And uh, as uh, uh, Dan Ariely calls it, we are predictably irrational, predictable in making a, uh, e a seemingly irrational move in the moment. I think in the same way, the way we optimize uh, uh, for what content, what we pay attention to, of course we, want to, we are attracted to environments where we feel comfortable, where we feel accepted, where, and, and that leads to this kind of uh, uh, environment. So the agency of, um, I, I, I think it's interesting to just take this and for a moment flip it. Um, <clears throat> from the individual's point of view, um, the rise of this kind of digital marketing, uh, the sense we might get <clears throat> from just dwell, dwelling on this point of view is, are we becoming more and more manipulated by powerful machines and machinery driven by data and analytics? Um, that makes us more and more susceptible to manipulation and we lose uh, sort of control of the situation. It's interesting, if any of you flip through a, um, an issue of Harvard Business Review, and there are often cover stories about digital marketing and, or actually uh, the, the digital world and what it means, this is written for business leaders. And there's essentially a complementary set of fears that are running through the, the minds of people who are worried about brands. That overnight, a brand that took decades to build, like, say, United Airlines, can be destroyed in 24 hours. Why? Because of the flip of this, which is not us no, no, being... No, no, because they beat the customers. What's that? <laughs> because they beat, they cast the shit out of, sorry, they beat customers. But perhaps not for the first time in their history, but what changed is this kind of mutual visibility at scale where a, an action that you would have found objectionable in the past would not get the kind of immediate visibility. I'm just pointing out, I'm not saying uh, the, the concerns um, from the individual's point of view are not legitimate, but it's just interesting to look at, again, there, it's multifaceted, and if we only look at one side, so it's interesting to say, well, if a brand is so vulnerable, and I believe they are, it's a, it's a dangerous environment now, to be inauthentic. All the marketing material in the world to sell while your product is great, the moment the product is out there and user reviews start to come in, if the product sucks, it doesn't matter how great your marketing is. So there is a demand for authenticity um, that creates a dangerous environment and also missteps which are more, you know, one, one action taken by actually a, a um, affiliate airline uh, that is sort of out of your control uh, in, in the moment, and then very problematic PR response, and, and very quickly things de deteriorate. So there's this, um, again, a, interesting counterbalance. But that's um, actually <clears throat> an example for empowerment of customers. Absolutely. So the question is, back to Trump, uh, mm -hmm. since it's where we began, um, if Trump is the product, why didn't those self-correcting behaviors, which are as new as micro-targeting, that allow people to rise up, voice what they think, and bring big corporations, big brands to their knees. Why did that not happen in the case of Trump? I think it's an important question to, to grapple with. And is the answer something about the power of micro-targeting? Or is there a deeper answer? What do you think, Michael? 
uh, about about his question. Well, there were like quite a few questions. Uh, I, I, there, I which... ended with one, which is, given the power of groups of people who can see each other, hear each other, to rise up when they don't like what some big actor is doing, whether it's a United Airlines... And that's exactly what they did in last election. Mm -hmm. They raised up against establishment and voted for the person whose message they liked. And you can disagree with the message, right. I can disagree with the message, but one thing that you cannot accuse Trump of is being inauthentic. So I He's the definition <clears throat> of being authentic. He tweets at 3 a.m., you know, whatever, you know, his brain tells him to tweet. So he's just really sharing with people, and people seem to like this, so, uh, some people seem to like it a lot. So I think the way I'd interpret that answer, I totally agree, is in terms of trying to do causal analysis and how important the micro-targeting, again, not to dismiss its power, but to, to agree with Mikhail that it is a arms race, and when you have any kind of mm -hmm. uh, campaigns running against each other, they're, they're, they're similar tools being used, similar arms, um, and, and, and there is this networked people power that can uh, actually be a forcing function against major forces. All of that was at play in this election, and so looking for micro-targeting as the, the factor, uh, uh, personally, I think is a, is a mistake. So I, it's, I don't it's one factor, at yeah. least, yes. and mm -hmm. I think we, we need to, to make uh, several differences. The, the one is that uh, looking at, at, at business developments like brands, um, you just did it, um, mm -hmm. you just talked about it, um, is different because that's about customer empowerment. If I'm thrown out of a plane, um, I can raise my voice and uh, I can start a campaign. That's customer empowerment. That's pretty, pretty good in the first place. It might be different with democracy. I'm totally with you. What happened is that people expressed uh, their will to, to have a, a counter thesis to establishment, and that's what they voted for, and that's what they get. But if we think of the, the way a dem democracy creates decision making, then I think there are some, some difficulties we are facing. Agree or not agree? Well, of course, we are, the democracy is, the, uh, is still in the making, you may say. We are far away from perfect democracy, and also we are far away from understanding actually what form of democracy, whether it should be direct democracy or indirect democracy, should we have electoral college or not. So there are plenty of questions there that remain to be answered. And like, just, I just wanted to come back for a second to, because you mentioned brands and how now customers are really empowered to see uh, to basically get access to information. So uh, information asymmetry is reduced, where you know, if you beat one customer as United, everyone will know. So guess what? Stop beating your customers, really pay more attention to your customers. But the same really relates to individuals. Right? So if you mistreat someone, uh, mistreat someone these days, or let's say you try to take advantage of someone while selling your stuff on eBay, again, other people will know. So I think that, you know, at the end of the day, but this kind of, <laughs> this kind of makes us better people. This makes brands better brands and uh, makes sellers on eBay less willing to cheat and also being more rewarded for uh, not cheating as they can uh, build uh, their reputation up. I think that also one thing that you mentioned, and I'm not sure if you kind of, it was uh, amplified enough, was that obviously digital environments and micro-targeting create new problems that we didn't have in the past. Like, a politician may try to tell you guys one story, and those guys a completely different story. But guess what? Digital environment, the same environment that enables that, also enables people, the mice, to communicate with each other, to basically fact-check uh, the politicians. Now, you've all heard about how the world is all now about fake news and how we're surrounded by fake news. Again, uh, first of all, I think it's just a myth. And to give you a radical example, think about people who lived 200 years ago. 99% of the things they did, they knew, was fake news. They just had no way of verifying the information, debunking the fake news. Now what happens is that you hear still a lot of fake information is out there, you hear it, but what happens is that you can immediately go and double check it. And guess what? You don't even have to do it yourself because there'll be plenty of people on Twitter on fa or Facebook and so on that will just do this for you. Which creates this impression, oh my God, there's so much fake news out there. Well, I don't see any evidence of the society becoming 
less well informed, I see a lot of evidence of the society getting out of their information bubble and actually seeing that they were surrounded by fake news and in the process of seeing, oh, those three facts that yesterday I learned are fake, you develop this uh, illusion that there's more, more fake news out there. Not at all. Just to pick up on your question about is democracy in trouble, um, <clears throat> I think that um, it is being challenged in some fundamental ways, and I, I just keep coming back to core properties of what a, uh, an internet where everyone, increasingly everyone around the world today, half, roughly half the world's population is carrying a supercomputer in their pocket that's connected, um, and this kind of um, uh, one of the main affordances is increased transparency, this kind of visibility at scale and ability to hear and act. And uh, I'm, I'm no uh, scholar of uh, founding of America, but one thing I, I have read is a, a basic fear that f the founding fathers had was democracy, was the idea of uh, the uh, tyranny of the majority and of any kind of a... Uh, 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 kind of direct control of the majority. And so many of the structures, as I understand it, of any well-functioning democracy slow things down and channel uh, popular um, interests and popular desires uh, in order to make sure that there isn't sudden disruptive changes that actually do damage to parts of the, the populace. And a very basic, maybe, uh, uh, a little you know, dangerously too simple view of the internet and its affordances is that it's like a kind of tidal wave that's just washing away a lot of those structures um, and untapping, unleashing a kind of democracy, a kind of visibility, a kind of ability for voices to suddenly emerge that by its very nature is more uh, destructive than constructive as a, as a kind of energy source. And I do believe in the end that is, that's human power that is being channeled. Uh, we have to learn how to rechannel it. We have to learn how to build structures that can slow things down. And, you know, I think uh, I've been, I, I had a, my driver uh, from the airport yesterday was a student from this wonderful university. I got a one hour tutorial on the, um, the recent history of Switzerland going back to the mid 1800s and all of the structures in place that actually slow things down. And some people sometimes complain this place can be kind of boring, but when the world around you gets too exciting, boring may look pretty good. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do these structures translate with um, the, uh, the new digital world we've created, which we will never hit undo. We will not be able to undo these affordances. That's a new reality. So I think that's the, uh, both the challenge but the opportunity as well, because we may be able to create even more effective structures, because the uh, way we can communicate and coordinate transcends anything we've been able to do before. So there's a lot of possibilities for uh, making things better. But th there is absolutely change in the air. And again, it's a different kind of decision making you're um, alluding to. So um, deciding what airline I would like to take for, the, for my next flight uh, is a decision I can uh, um, uh, revise and, and withdraw next week and I can make a new decision um, in politics uh, and in democracy. It's, uh, it's, for, it's a decision that lasts four years. We, we're going to be experiencing this now with an interesting um, model in the US. Um, one decision, four years, impact. That's Hopefully four years. Or longer. Or longer. Yeah, or eight or twelve. I wouldn't like to entertain this this idea much much more at the moment, but I'd like to go a little bit deeper into into the question of transparency and and the methodology that's behind the the big data analytics. I've read somewhere, uh, Michael, that that data analysts know us much better than our parents and our partners, and I would like to know whether this is true, that um, a data analyst um, analyzing seventy. Uh, Facebook likes knows me better than a friend. A data analyst analyzing 150 Facebook likes knows me better than my parents. And a data analyst analyzing 300 Facebook likes knows me better than my partner does. True? Well, it very much depends on how you define knows, knowing someone. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, it's not data analyst. It's an algorithm. 
so there, you, if you define knowing someone as, let's say, knowing their personality or being able to uh, detect their uh, psychological traits such as personality, then that's true that an algorithm given uh, 150 likes would be able to predict your personality with higher accuracy uh, by filling the questionnaire in your name uh, than uh, your parents would be able to uh, predict it by, again, filling the questionnaire in your name. Now, the most accurate of the judges, I'm not actually sure if you mentioned it, uh, your spouse, 230. Um, 230. I 230. thought 300. 300. 300. It's getting, it's oh, getting, it's getting better. The algorithms reduced, are getting ever goodness. better. <laughs> okay. But uh, yes, and but then at the end of the day, you could also um, ask a question: Why would we even ask computers to reduce us to those five numbers, five personality traits that we humans used to describe each other? Now, the advantage that algorithms have over us is that they don't have to be limited to describing other people or people if they're algorithms, uh, in terms of five numbers of this personality traits. And by the way, this is uh, big five personality traits is what, for instance, would be used in recruitment and selection. So when you're being recruited, or if uh, you go to an IO psych uh, industrial organizational psychologist to give you career advice, they would probably give you a questionnaire, measure maybe your IQ, maybe your skills, maybe your personality. So basically reduce you to five, six, nine numbers, and then from those numbers, those ex uh, they would extrapolate to make assumptions about uh, your future life, your future career, which career you would prefer, which job you would excel at, and so on. And we, do it the se we actually do the same thing with our friends and, and even family members, right? When we just put, you know, put them in the buckets, you know, like uh, um, a young person with interest in trains. I don't know what young people are interested today in. <laughs> So, or like uh, a sporty guy enjoying hiking, right? We put those, those labels on people and stereotypes, and in fact, they allow us to uh, basically save some mental energy so we don't have to, we can just go efficiently, th efficiently through our lives and know hundreds of people and then kind of understand them somewhat, right? You cannot understand them in a great detail, you can understand them somewhat by putting them in a bucket, and then just by remembering that this is a sporty guy that likes, I don't know, tennis, because you know other sporty guys that like tennis, you can kind of extrapolate and predict their behavior. Knowing that someone is an extrovert, you can predict that they will make a good salesman. But now computers, again, are not limited to labeling us using those few labels only. They will still use labels, but they can use 500 labels, like Facebook Newsfeed AI, that decides which stories to show you in the morning when you open Facebook, the face, this uh, AI would use 500 numbers to describe you. But you can go up. You can go up to 2,000, 20,000, 200,000 numbers. Obviously, if from different other, for different other reasons, like going to too, into too many numbers makes no sense. We are not so complicated, actually, at the end of the day. Uh, but you would agree, or I would agree with myself, maybe you would agree with me, uh, that describing people using 500 numbers is a way more robust way of describing humans than just reducing them to five numbers. So I think that, it, and this, I say it in a hopeful way, because it also means that things like career advice, uh, psycholo psychological diagnosis, career planning, education, entertainment, uh, and so on, so uh, kind of context in which you had other people supporting you or other people advising you, which book to read, which career to choose, all of those fields can be greatly improved by use of algorithms. And they can be especially improved for underprivileged people who lack role models to tell them you'll make a good lawyer, who lack good librarians to tell them, oh, this is the book you will enjoy reading who lack access to psychologists who tell them, hey, you seem to be developing a depression, maybe you should go and seek some help or take some medicine. Now, with a huge fraction of, gen uh, of, of humanity is deprived of such services, and algorithms could be, give them a chance to access them. Okay, so that's a pretty, pretty optimistic view. Um, means we are um, ending um, the age of stereotyping. Um, we, are, um, we are opening up the, the, the chance to, to enter a new period of enabling people, empowering people. Are you, are you f um, supporting that? Uh well, look, I, I think the, um, <coughs> the capabilities 
uh, are clearly new, advancing every day. Uh, um, there's the number of people that are applying machine learning and collecting data in different ways is just multiplying at a dizzying rate. And so I, I think it's early days of understanding what the limits of this kind of modeling capability. And not to uh, uh, forget, we're getting better and better at um, uh, functionally imaging brains and connecting behavior to mechanism. So there's just uh, an explosion of activity in understanding the human brain and mind and, and linking it to behavior. So um, it's, a, uh, it's exciting times just in terms of the science. Um, in terms of trying to project the human impact, um, I totally agree with Mikhail that there are very convincing positive scenarios. There's equally convincing uh, negative scenarios. Uh, if, if one thing I, I, I'm confident of, it's our lack of ability to predict mm -hmm. um, how these things will play out. Um, I, I, I know I have Maybe the, we should ask the algorithms. AI. <laughs> I mean, I have the... the, the um, of course, the challenge is as, as complex as the AI algorithms are, um, there will always be humans in the loop. Um, you know, will AIs end up deciding to keep us as pets? Uh, will they decide we're not even good for that? Um, but as long as there are humans around and in the loop, the complexity is actually a product of the, um, the AI capabilities we're creating and the people who don't forget uh, each of us have this black box we're carrying around in our heads, uh, what Marvin Minsky called our, the meat machines, um, and how they uh, do what they do is beyond um, understanding. We don't understand how we think. We don't understand. So there's incredibly complex system without AI in the loop. And, we, and on top of that, we're, we're bringing this in. How to predict, I mean, again, just look at, um, uh, since our theme is transparency in the internet, um, the founders of the internet, uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who, who named my lab, Social Machines, his vision of the World Wide Web uh, was a uh, techno-utopian vision. And he's very critical about uh, his invention and what he, he uh, has become uh, of it. And, and if you ask him, if you say, Tim, did you know all of this would unfold? The answer is no, because you know, we're complicated. And you would think if in a more connected world, um, on, you know, uh, in some, things must be positively biased. I do think technologies have inherent biases. A gun is, uh, has affordances which are biased towards creating more violence in the world. Uh, in that sense, uh, I would have guessed, and I continue to feel, that on balance, technologies that connect us um, are positively biased. But it's very easy to see um, how uh, even with a design bias in the technology, it can go in different directions, especially when you have the complexity of interconnected, you've got loopy causality, you've got dynamical systems. So I, I can see the argument for why these technologies will benefit uh, the underserved uh, more on balance. Similar arguments have been made in the past for computers and education and so forth, and it hasn't always played out that way. So it's, uh, it's really a question of, are we learning lessons from the past, applying them? And I think we just have to all be humble in our uh, predictions. Not that we shouldn't imagine a future. In fact, we, we must have a North Star that we steer towards. But just to be uh, humble in our ability to really know what, what comes between where we are and, and where we're going, because uh, things are complicated. Let's step into some of the black boxes that are represented <laughs> in, in this audience. Um, you brought your brains. Thank you for doing this. And uh, I hope I you no can. They had no other choice, yeah. The future will be different, but today that's, uh, that's the case. And maybe some questions came up um, uh, regarding the, the discussion and regarding the, the related outcome. We, we tapped upon privacy, uh, transparency, and uh, the role of the human being in the future. Maybe some of you wonder what, what might come next. So any questions? Please, go ahead. Maybe you, you say your name and, and introduce Hi, I'm yourself. Agnes. Hello, I'm a master's student at this university, and I have a question towards you, or towards all of you. Um, in regards to micro-targeting, targeting, you were very positive or very optimistic about it, and I'm just wondering, especially within my network, I feel like the plurality of content gets lost, and my ability to think critical about the content, if I get all these targeted messages, and I feel like that topic wasn't really touched upon, and I feel like 
we talked about that information asymmetry is being reduced, and I feel like, yes, but at the same time, plurality is being lost. So you feel like you're living in an echo chamber, I and just, suddenly your world shrunk to just your no, small No, I just feel like network. the social network that I have is often the people in my social network are quite similar to myself. So where is, I mean, that's choices I make, but I think that's human tendency that your social network is close to what you are. So where is the plurality of content if we all get targeted with the same message? I, thanks for this question. It's a really important one. And uh, so um, there's this theory of uh, echo chambers uh, um, where that we somehow are now just within our network where the plurality is lost. And it's definitely true that one of our basic mental properties is called confirmation bias, which means that we have a preference for information that confirms what we already knew. We just like it more. If you are a Republican, you kind of like hearing things that confirm your views, and if you're a Democrat, uh, you do the same, and those information, usually, uh, information universes will be somewhat disconnected. But when you say, oh my God, now the world is going to pieces because of the social networks, I think that it's very important to compare the echo chambers of today with echo chambers of tomorrow. And what happens is that our echo chambers, guys, were never so large with so much plurality in them and with so much easy access to dissenting and different points of view. Think about it for a second. If you were born, I already used this today, I'm not sure if here or somewhere else, if you were born 200 years ago in a little village, your whole spectrum of information you never had access to was whatever the local priest, librarian, if you were lucky to have one, a teacher if you were lucky to have one, and your parents told you about. You knew nothing about the world, basically. You had no information, no even chance of ever getting outside of your information bubble. Now you're just one click away from your information bubble. Your bubble is huge and expanding. Is you, an average human being, never in the history of the world, has access and actually actively consumed so much information. And this is both in terms of you know, your access to Wikipedia, through uh, silly stories about uh, cats meowing on Facebook, to even things like music. Spotify, for instance, believed for the longest time when they started that as the globalization and information bubble theory kicks in, everyone in the world basically will be listening to Lady Gaga and maybe a few more other artists. So they even actually were structuring their agreements with artists under this assumption that in the future there will be like just few artists and the rest people will be like just consumers of music. Now what happened in reality is that they noticed that the trend became completely opposite that the very algorithms that are <laughs> advising you what thing you would like, they don't put you in a bucket. Quite the opposite, they expand your horizons in an unprecedented way, in, for a few reasons. Why? For, first of all, no one wants to listen to Poker Face more than once a day. <laughs> so this natural tendency to, okay, give me something I would like, but something that I haven't listened to yet today, because we as humans actually have also this preference for new information. Not everyone, but it's also a psychological scale, but on average we do. But also, from the point of view of the company like Spotify, it makes total economic sense, instead of playing you Lady Gaga all the time, that they probably have to pay a lot for, to just sh play you some other songs of the other artists to kind of expand, so use those algorithms to expand your horizons. The same about Facebook, showing you the same story about what Trump said yesterday uh, for the end time wouldn't keep you engaged in uh, uh, something new to throw in the bucket will make you interested, which basically results in your horizons expanding and not narrowing. And that just let me close this with why there is a theory now of the information bubble or echo chamber. Well, the theory is there because suddenly your echo chambers, as, as they started expanding, they also stopped perfectly overlapping. If you lived in Soviet Russia or US in the 60s or in Poland in the 70s, you, there was one newspaper, one TV station that was government approved. Everyone had exactly the same access to information. There was no recommendation at platforms there choosing what you want to read. So you didn't even, when you were never exposed even to information from outside of your bubble. Guess what? If you never see your bubble from outside, you don't even know it exists. Now, the moment that our bubble started expanding, but also getting apart from each other, suddenly you hear voices, and you're just one click away. I know you uh, complain about your network, but 
just use this mouse a bit more and you know, read Breitbart News from time to time. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, so when our bubbles started diverging, you started seeing your bubble from outside from time to time. You started seeing, oh my god, other people are talking about all of those things that I've never heard of. I must be in the information bubble. It's all fault of Facebook and algorithms and whatnot. So yes, there is an information bubble, but it's growing at an unprecedented speed, and we never had as much diverse information as we have today. Can I quick quick respond, response from... In the past, I was reading one newspaper. I would just buy an actual paper. I'm not sure if you guys are younger than me a bit, so I'm not sure if you actually know what it looks like. It's like a, a piece of paper, and you just <laughs> buy it. Every week, the same one, and there is a, a basically a head editor that decides what goes into this newspaper, and that's his vision that is being presented. His information bubble now is being imposed on me. Now, today, I don't buy any newspapers anymore, and just from Facebook, I'm probably getting like 20 different titles Every day, and some of this stuff but that I'm reading there. they get the stories from the same news provider. They even use the same language often, like the newspapers. You read the same story in like five newspapers. They get well, it from like one news company. Often. I'm not sure how much you like reading the same story five times over. I would uh, choose different stories each time. Uh, well, if you really try hard, you can be in an information bubble. But an average person is getting more diverse information I than I would say ever. it's exactly the other way around. If you try hard, you can get out of the bubble. If you're an average person, you stay in the but bubble. But this is an opinion that actually has a scientific answer. So sorry, because we can all have our opinions at the end of the day. Some people believe that there are people flying in the sky. Others believe that people walk on the water. But at the end of the day, we can prove those things. And what I'm saying, you, telling you now, that an average user of Spotify is listening to 20% more uh, uh, artists every year. I believe you use the Spotify argument and this Facebook. Is a, uh, with Facebook, I cannot actually come up with the data because I don't remember exact numbers, but I've been to the lecture a few weeks ago that was showing how a number of different outlets of diverse political affiliation that a given person reads per day is growing very much in the same direction. So an, an average individual is reading way more and more, way more diverse inf uh, information, and this is a scientific fact that you can observe. You can actually go and read stats about how, you know, how users uh, diversify now. I will try to believe Ma you. Maybe, maybe we need to m differentiate again, because Spotify, totally with you, I know that, that, that study, that's, that's great, uh, expanding uh, your horizon. If we look at a recent study, I think it, it's from 2015, on American colleagues did that, uh, on, on uh, 54 million Facebook users um, pointing at confirmation bias and trying to feed in uh, contradictory information um, and trying to figure out whether people could be convinced that their view was just one view or that other views <laughs> would be um, um, uh, as uh, valuable and, and, and usable as, as uh, one's own ones. Um, the people basically declined to to deal with the with the contradictory information and, and said that's conspiracy. And yeah. the, the basic re reaction was cons uh, other information is conspiracy, and there is something in it regarding political information that that's probably relevant. So I just wanted to, yeah. uh, I guess, give a, a different answer, which is, I think if you go far enough back in time, it it is the case that we were in more extreme bubbles than we are today. But I think uh, it's more likely we're experiencing a U-shaped curve where it, it increased, but there is actually a decline in sort of diversity of views. Um, and again, I, I know I sound like a broken machine here, but to not just focus on the internet, I think is an important uh, uh, to contextualize. In the United States, once upon a time, <clears throat> half a century ago, there were three major television broadcast networks, very similar to, to having one, uh, which were serving, by necessity, the, the center, the, uh, the sort of the mainstream, uh, because uh, in order to get large enough market share. Uh, the introduction of cable television uh, radically changed the landscape of media. Um, perhaps with more influence on what happened last year, uh, again, than the internet, when Pew asked Americans in a poll, uh, do you often get your news source from, and uh, social media, roughly 40%, this was last year's poll, said, I often get my news from, from Facebook. 
uh, which is a crazy high number until you rec realize that um, when asked, you get your news often from television, the answer is 70%. So, you know, um, and, and that also went through this splintering. So where Fox News households, Fox News is just on 12, 14 hours a day. It's just in the background. And you're not changing the channel to CNN in that household and vice versa in a CNN household. But one more example of look deeper than the internet for the causes of fragmentation. Um, uh, there is a, a book that I recommend for anyone interested in this topic called The Big Sort not short, The Big Sort, S-O-R-T, written by Bill Bishop. Uh, it's a story of uh, how America spatially self-segregated. It started in the early 1970s. There is every way you cut the data, it shows the same story, which is over the last half century, uh, Americans moved, mobilized uh, within the country. Uh, to give you one data point, uh, in a 10-year span in the 1990s, when the population of America was something a little north of 300 million. Um, well, I've now set it up so it's obvious, but guess how many people uh, moved in a 10-year period? Just in your mind, think of a number. Uh, so the number is 100 million, a third of America in 10 years. And it wasn't just in 10 years that everyone moved and then froze, right? There's been this movement, and what we optimize for when we can move. One of the prime factors uh, Bishop describes is cultural preference. Oh, this neighborhood feels good. There's lattes in the cafe. I like lattes. Well, that actually indexes for an awful lot of other things, and there's been this uh, convergence process. So um, this kind of fragmentation uh, and preference to be uh, with others like us, so the serendipity starts to be uh, less and less uh, diverse. Um, there is something actually happening literally on the ground um, that I believe is a, if you're looking for root causes, um, for why is it we have a preference for more and more extreme narratives? Um, and uh, I, I think in terms of the, you know, is there a filter bubble or is there no such effect? Um, I, I guess from uh, data and also just knowledge of the evolution of the media ecosystem, it, it seems uh, inevitable that there will be a decrease in sort of entropy in sort of the, uh, because we are self-selecting. Um, I think there's interesting um, counter movements. I think a lot of us probably in this room, the fact that you're here, uh, I'm guessing you're interested in, you're interested in seeing other points of view. There's probably a much higher than average interest amongst everyone in this room to kind of burst your bubble or see the other point of view or understand, you know, what is uh, the points of view that you're missing. So um, some controversy on, on stage, which is good, and uh, I'd like to take some more questions, maybe short questions, short answers, so that we get uh, some, some people involved. There's a question here and there's a question over there. Hi, uh, I'm Othman, I'm from MIT, and I study polarization. And so my question is on how um, we, we, the buckets that you talked about. I remember a study where people got assigned in classes and being told that they were assigned by scholastic achievement. And at the end, there were differences in scholastic achievement, even though actually they were assigned randomly. And so this, this confirmation bias actually creating self-fulfilling prophecies, um, how do you see it play in this world where, given, given the personalized marketing, we are being put in more and more buckets? So maybe on the conscious level it works, maybe on an unconscious level it doesn't work, but uh, do those buckets, just because we believe in them, do they become true then? Uh, because of the algorithms that are in our brains and in the computers that we use? That's a great question, thanks for that. If we talk about the same study, I believe that actually did not replicate. Um, uh, so I don't think that actually this works um, uh, with intelligence. Uh, but it's definitely true that people now can self-select themselves into buckets. They can move uh, to, the, to California if they enjoy good weather uh, and other um, uh, hipsters. Uh, out there, if they move to North California, uh, they can go to websites that serve the news that they prefer. That's, that's definitely the case. But 
you guys see it, as kind of majority of people I feel see it as a limiting factor, whereas I can't stop seeing it and also seeing data confirming that this is a discovery mechanism. Think, let me just again offer you an extreme example, not going back in time, just today. If you're born in a family of traditional religious fundamentalists, for instance, and the only thing you get there from your local community is the same uniform message, but then you go on Facebook, if you're allowed to, and you suddenly see all of, those, uh, this, all of this other information out there. It's a discovery method. Maybe you still kind of like all of the things that your community likes around you, but maybe your pattern will be slightly different, and the, this, and the discovery algorithm, the recommendation system, will detect, hey, this guy does not look like all of his uh, uh, kind of friends in this kind of traditional cluster. He's slightly different. Let me try showing him this new story. Maybe he will click on it. Why am I showing you this story as Facebook? Because I hope you will click on it and maybe then I make some money. But from your perspective, this is a great discovery mechanism. I use Amazon Kindle to uh, suggest me new books and it takes me way away from my bubble. It's a recommender system that studies my book preferences and understands them probably better than anyone else, and yet it's constantly able to give me books that I would never otherwise come across because books are being read in my environment, because we're all similar, we kind of self-select ourselves also in jobs and, uh, and geographical areas and so on, and they basically would never heard of this book before. But Amazon Kindle, being able to observe millions of people reading books, knows, hey, this guy actually, you look like the guy that would like this book, even if you naturally never heard about it. So it's also a discovery mechanism, and again, I don't see why, why we kind of can, uh, yeah, I should stop here. Next, next question, up front. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Anjan, I'm from ETH in Zurich here. Uh, I have a question that's probably slightly off topic. Uh, so if we collect more and more data about ourselves, and algorithms get better at replicating our actions, will we lose the um, possibility to authenticate actions that actually happened? So for example, I, I read about a study that um, where the research group was able to merge two videos. So there, there was a video of Donald Trump and the researcher, and the researcher was talking. And then the merged video um, showed Donald Trump talking or speaking the words of, of the researcher. So will we lose the video as, as a medium of proof that something actually happened? It's definitely already happening. Um, there are methods for, given a frame of video, predicting what future frames will look like, so to kind of bring motion where there wasn't or, uh, and, and steer in different ways. So I think no different than Photoshop has done to images. And uh, knowing what the the um, uh, causal chain of where that image came from and having uh, a network of human trust uh, all the way to the original sensor um, is, is critical, right, for how we treat images today. Um, and uh, the same capability is essentially a kind of Photoshop capability for video, which it lets you alter the content, um, is already well under its way. There's, there's a lot of um, technologies that can do, you know, and again, there's the positive side of this. If you are a creative storyteller, you can tell amazing stories in vivid video, but the ability to, um, uh, uh, you know, there was a big controversy over how many people came to Donald Trump's inauguration, the inauguration, uh, uh, and you might wonder how could you possibly disagree with what seems to be a, an evident fact. You've got photographic evidence, unless you don't trust uh, either that the image is real or you don't trust the perspective that was taken. There's a photographer who purposefully uh, took a shot uh, from the wrong angle or before the inauguration started. How do I know the timestamp was right? So there's various ways that uh, as soon as you don't trust the source, but with video, because we didn't have the technology to, uh, to fake it, um, there was something more authentic, but that's eroding. That's, uh, I, I think, absolutely the case. One last question. Oh, okay, the two. We take the two of you. Maybe we, we collect it, first you, then, then you, and then you can answer that. Thanks. Uh, my name is Nick. I study at this university. And I was wondering, uh, like, how well are those big data field algorithms really work? Because you talked about, irras irras uh, like, predictable irras irrationality. Mm. 
uh, but like almost nobody, for example, predicted the Trump victory. So we're like, I see a little bit of a discrepancy there. Okay, and quickly switch the Microsoft over. I almost feel a little bit guilty. We should hand this uh, to the students. Um, I, um, my name is Johan Hintik. I run a software company, and uh, we do telecoms, AI, and, and machine learning. Um, I have a question about the democratic, uh, the democracy being challenged, as, as was said here. Now, if you look at the way the democracy has uh, operated, I think there's been a, um, a certain moderation to it, whether it's been the journalist before publishing the story, or whether it's been the electoral college or some form of representation of the people before actually making the decision. So isn't the problem really at the moment the fact that the, the message is blunt and direct and it's never been that way. So the impact in a way is different. So in a way uh, we've accustomed to a different way of operating within the democracy with this moderation in, in place. The functioning of the algorithms and the democracy in moderation. Who wants to answer? I guess I can comment on the first one, and then you want to take the second one? <laughs> I had the same preference, actually, but uh, we can do this <laughs> this way. <laughs> I'll be very brief then, and, and then pass to you for the first, which is, I think, you ask a key question, which is, uh, I mean, all, all of the prediction we're talking about is at individual level. Predicting group behavior is a whole nother uh, ball game, and uh, I think if you are a pollster or a journalist in America today, I believe this is also true in the UK, you're asking yourself as a profession a lot of basic hard questions about what went wrong and how could so many people be surprised. They were. Uh, there were op-ed pieces in all the major newspapers in the US started in the summer saying, okay, we admit we, we missed what's going on. We're sending journalists out there now to figure out what we missed. Um, so there was a, a level of surprise that uh, I think is a, it's a key question. Where is, that, where is that surprise coming from? Well, maybe the problem is that they're sending journalists now to figure out what went wrong and they should be sending out scientists. Because if you have journalists <coughs> running polls, then it won't work well. Um, because journalists are amazing, but not at running polls. Now, when you look at polls that are run by scientists, uh, they actually were giving Trump quite a, lot of, uh, quite a lot of chances of winning. If I remember, what was 533, right, this website? 538. Yeah, 538, 40% uh, chances of Trump winning, uh, if I remember correctly. So, and, then, uh, and they used a very advanced methodology, and, uh, and for, the longest, for the longest time, they actually were giving Trump way more chances than any of the newspaper-run polls on a smaller and less representative, perhaps, uh, samples. And also... I think that perhaps most more important question is that even if, you, if we know that algorithms are better than humans in making many decisions, they win games uh, with us, they can navigate us through geographical space better, they can calculate, uh, uh, they can deal with equations way better and analyze large data sets. We increasingly see that they are out-competing doctors in interpreting x-ray data and uh, other data that's uh, diagnostic data from, um, and from our bodies. Uh, we know that they outcompete judges at predicting whether a person will re-offend or not, and increasingly, not sure if you guys realize, increasingly sentences in, US, in the US and in some other countries are being basically issued by algorithms. The judge is just pronouncing whatever he read there on the, or kind of making decision that is heavily influenced by uh, an algorithm. And we know, in fact, that use of those algorithms is reducing the incarceration rates. So you can retain the same level of reoffending and yet release way more people from prison because an algorithm is basically way, is better able than a judge to predict whether a given person will reoffend or not. But then obviously we also can see the history, how the algorithms, you know, how you could really easily win with computers even in checkers, I don't know, 30 years ago. And now uh, we basically see the algorithms are becoming more and more powerful. So the trend is pretty clear. So maybe, what, maybe what, because we're running out of time, one, one uh, quick answer to, to his question. There's on no quick answer to that question. That's yeah. why we're avoiding it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I just wanted to add a, 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 a quick addendum, which is I actually think, so when I said send the journalists out, that was to get the story of why the pollsters are the scientists yes. supposing to predict what happened. But actually, 
uh, if you ask Nate Silver, you ask Nate Cohn, you ask a lot of the pollsters, um, uh, were you surprised? The first answer they'll give is, well, look at our models, 40%. Actually, we were off by a few tens of thousands of votes. But then you say, no, no, no. Go back 12 months to your data and to your, your predictions of possible outcomes. And then literally their body language. Many, I've, I've now been talking to pollsters, and they say, oh, yeah, no. I had, on, based on what we knew, the data and so forth, this did not seem like a remote possibility. And so this idea that something actually new came into being, um, this kind of public awareness that something different could happen, I think happened in a few months. And so pollsters continuously update their probabilities. So if you're, complete, if you're continuously updating on new data, you'll never be off by huge numbers. So the real question is go back, because the smaller, the more frequent you, you're updating the model, the less the, the predictive value of the polls. We want forecasts that could be wrong. We want forecasts that are looking further out. So the shorter the time horizon, the smaller the margin of errors. But ask the human beings. Those scientists are people. And, uh, and, and one of the interesting things about journalists in America, pollsters in America, is at a social level, they don't know these people. And even the pollster who calls you up to ask you a question, sure. there's, there's bias in who picks up the so phone. So ask the human beings, that was your, your, uh, one of your uh, phrases. Uh, you, you tried to ask the human beings on, on democracy and uh, moderation, but didn't get an answer, which is an answer by itself, I guess. And we will all be having um, at least two chances this year to see how um, data analytics and micro-targeting will uh, impact political developments and elections. Uh, one is France on Sunday, um, the, the um, duel between um, Macron and Le Pen, and the other one is the German election in uh, September, so we will be very curious on what we can learn uh, by, by those two uh, decision-making processes. Thank you so much to the two of you for, for the discussion with a little bit controversy. I actually mm. didn't expect it, but I'm happy because... Uh, you tried. That, that, yeah, you tried well. <laughs> that uh, helps to make up our minds. And thanks for your attention and being here. And have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, guys.